Hey guys, how are you? So I decided to film just the first part of this vlog from my balcony because people are always curious to see how things look. So uh, I'm in Montreal here and this is Mount Royal. Um, I live in a place called Outremont and um, it's pretty cool because the park is right across the street. Um, right around the corner there are uh, an interesting person who lives right near me is uh, an heiress to a billionaire just a couple blocks away. Uh, Leonard Cohen is buried just up the street, so it's kind of a cool area. And I, uh, I grew up, you know, not grew up, but I went to school around here, university, well, you know, 25 minutes away. And I figured I'd move back here uh, at this point in time in my life. It's kind of cool. In this video, I want to talk about the um, lifestyle of a freelance developer, whether it be web developer or whatnot. And we'll touch on a little bit about the entrepreneurial lifestyle. I'm going to give you some of the pros and cons, what to expect, and the personality type that you may, uh, you have to have really to get into that. For me, it's largely about personal freedom and choice. Um, even where I live, I'm in a situation here where I can get up and and travel whenever I want to without too much uh, planning needed. Again, that's one of the advantages of being an entrepreneur, being a company owner, you have that flexibility to move on, to travel whenever you want to. So that's kind of a cool thing. So anyway, so here is Montreal. This is my view. Um, it's kind of cool. Hey guys, so let's talk about the lifestyle of the freelance developer, whether it be a web developer or any type of programmer, really, or a web designer. The number one thing that you get out of being a freelancer is personal freedom. You have the choice when to work, when not to work, how you want to work, what clients you want to pick up, what type of jobs you want to do. Now, of course, in the beginning, when you're first establishing yourself, you're going to be under a little bit more stress than you would be otherwise, unless you like that kind of thing, or unless you set it up properly where you uh, transition into the freelancer lifestyle. But I'm going off on a tangent here. So generally speaking, let's assume that you've, you've gotten through the initial humps or you've gotten the proper training, and so you move into the freelancer career path properly so you don't put unnecessary stress on yourself and when you do that properly you get up and running pretty quickly meaning that um, you can shave a lot of time off of becoming a, a successful freelancer if you just do it properly anyway I don't know if that makes sense but uh, let's go on so we're going to talk about the lifestyle so you have a lot more freedom but that doesn't, nece that doesn't necessarily mean you have a lot more time especially in the early going when you first get out there because when you first get out out there as a freelancer I assume that many of you are going to be junior developers or budding developers so you're going to have to learn your craft you're going to have to learn your skill and one of the things I keep hitting on is that as you become more skilled as a developer you're going to develop better workflows and better um, ways of dealing and managing your clients this is going to be a big uh, part of your ability to make your more money for your time. So let me deal with one thing at a time. So let's talk about communication skills. I touched off on this in another video. A big part of managing the project is being able to manage your clients, manage what their expectations will be, and manage the process in terms of your relationship with the client. So I'll give you one example. So you go and you meet your client and you sit down and they go over the project with you. They tell you what they want for the project. Your job as a, de uh, as a developer is to set up a reasonable time timeline so that, so that they can expect, uh, so that they know what to expect in terms of when you're gonna get the work out. So let's say you're developing a basic web app. So I can tell you right from the start that 
between uh, the middle stages of the project where you've set up the basic look and style of the site and the web app, you've set up the basic functionality. When you have that basic stuff in place versus having the very final live production version of the web app, there's going to be a, this big gap typically because that last 10% of the project will take a lot of time simply because you're dealing with back and forth with the clients. There's going to be lag time in, in the communications and they're going to try and change a bunch of things a lot of the times. That's where you get this thing called fe feature creep, feature creep, where they got something basic there and then they're like, wow, maybe we should have the app do this and maybe we should have the app do that. Maybe we and a beginner freelancer would make the mistake of agreeing to these changes. So when you go in there, in terms of managing expectation, you have to document pretty much what it is that uh, you're going to deliver and you have to make it clear to the client that we, we have to be uh, certain what we have with some only minor changes that are going to be put into place based on the needs of the project because otherwise they're going to go wild. And you have to set this up right from the get-go. You have to say to them, we have to be sure that this is what our target is the price is based on this target, the timeline is based on this target, and you remind them every time you add or make changes, you're extending the time, you're increasing the cost potentially. So you have to uh, create that expectations in their mind so that they are aware of this before the project begins. You don't want to start addressing these issues in mid-project because then you can run into some conflict. So the other thing I talked about, and that's just one example I could go on, but just to give you a little taste, another thing I talked about was workflows. Now workflows, you can look at it from the point of view just in terms of how you manage your clients. Do you go see them in meetings, or you do Skype calls, or you do phone calls, or emails, a combination of the two? You have to set up a good workflow in that regard where you're not always on the phone wasting time with them, you're not in there all the time talking to them. You go in there, you set up the initial meeting, you get, your, you get their specification from them, you send them a document, a nice clear document, lots of bullet points, paragraph, bullet point, paragraph, very simple to the point, with the uh, outline of your project, what the work is gonna be, and then when you, they agree on it in email, then you, you either get a digital signature or you go in one time and you get them to sign on that on the paper, they get a copy, you get a copy. So everybody knows what the expectation is. That's the main point of a, of a contract, is to set, uh, to make sure everybody's clear and everybody is reminded of what is expected out of this uh, temporary partnership, you as a supplier, as a developer, them as a client. And this is very important because sometimes memories will get confused later on. So you have it on paper, but they agree to X, Y, and Z, less likely you're going to have issues. So when you're managing the client, you've got to be sure that you set up a, a relationship where they're not always pestering you, not always expecting you to come in and see them. For instance, I have friends of mine who have a, a contracting business, and one of their biggest gripes now with their main clients, they're always expected to come in go see them every week and it's like every two weeks and it just takes a lot of uh, takes up a lot of their time to set up the meeting to go in to travel there etc cetera, etc cetera. so you have to manage that expectation right from the get-go so you don't want to waste your time of course there's a lot more de detail I could get into here but uh, this is just a vlog so let me get back to workflow now in terms of your own internal workflow meaning your, your development process as a beginner you're going to be learning the whole thing, so you're going to be figuring out the best way to manage the coding of a project, the actual writing of the software and the configuring of things and so forth. So in the beginning, you're going to be charging less because you're just going to be working much slower. But as you get more advanced, you settle on a particular framework that you're going to use. So for instance, I'll just use PHP as an example you decide you're going to be a PHP developer, you're going to develop web apps for small businesses, you say, I'm PHP, I'm going to go with Laravel because Laravel is the best today. So once you really know your way around Laravel and how it's set up and how it works, you'll get pretty good with one or two projects. 
then when you set up the next project, it'll be like, because you won't have to figure out how it's done. And I'll give you an example. Now, when I was actively develop, uh, in development as a freelancer in the late 90s, well, 90s and the two, early 2000s, I had my own MVC based framework that I wrote in Java. I didn't like the frameworks that existed at the time, and so I just wrote my own. It was something, it was Servlets, JSP, and Pojo based. Uh, Servlets is the, I'm trying to avoid the jargon, it's the part of Java that allows you to do all the web app stuff. JSP works with Servlets, uh, JSP allows you to more easily create the visual aspect of your web apps. And then POJOS is, is an acronym for Plain Old Java Beans. So uh, where the community was going to is these very complex um, Java objects called EJBs. I didn't like that architecture at all. This is during EJB 1 or 2, just in case you guys are Java fans. So I said, forget it. My architecture is going to be POJO, Plain Old Java Beans combined with uh, JSP and Servlets. I won't go beyond that in the technical details anyway. So I had my own framework. And after several projects, I had written this thing up. So I had my, uh, my database layer all done, the generic, my, my UI layer all done. I had my, uh, the basic structure that I would apply to just about every app done. So I used the 80-20 rule uh, when developing my MV, MVC framework. The 80-20 rule is that 80% of the work will be from of your time will be wasted, will be on 20% of the app. So I wrote my MVC, I designed my MVC to not try to do everything, but rather just to solve that, that, that key 20% that took up 80% of the time. I don't know if that makes any sense. Anyway, so I created my MVC framework. Once that was in place and I had the workflow in place, I knew how to, you know, I could set up, boom, bang, bang, get it going. And I would even, there's a little trick, I would even subtly direct my client to want to have their app work in such a way that was compatible with my MVC framework or more compatible, which saved me a lot of time. So I would tell them, I would say, okay, you want to do it like this, but I would say you, suggest you go this route, do it like this, this section of their app, and it will save you time. It works well. I've done it for several other clients. It will save me time in development, so it's going to save you money, and it's going to work amazingly. And nine times out of ten, they would say, okay, that's cool. So I would direct them that way. And then the workflow to develop their app was so much easier and so much quicker. These are just a couple of examples of uh, how uh, you can you know, develop your skills as a developer, employ better workflows and, I'm talking, and, and client management to just make yourself more profitable. And... Yeah, so that's how that works. So this is this is what I this is an example, a small taste of what I'm talking about. What I'm saying that becoming a good coder is not just about it's not just about uh, writing uh, code. It's there's much more to it than that. There's the developing your workflows, knowing with what IDEs to use, uh, what your deployment environments are, what server configs you're going to use. All these type of things, how you manage your clients, how you manage expectations, uh, how you write out your contract so that it makes sense. At the end of the day, if I was going to give a piece of advice in this vlog, you want to keep it simple. So let's go back to the original subject. The original subject, before I went off on a tangent, was the entrepreneur lifestyle as the, as the freelance developer. So by implementing strong workflows, and uh, whether it be your own internal workflows in terms of your coding or how you manage your clients, this is going to allow you to free up more and more time and become much more profitable in the type of work that you do. And uh, communication skills goes into this in a big way in terms of managing a client so that you, ha you have to learn to speak in a language that the client understands. So here's a big tip. If you're going in to see, for instance, a client who owns a butcher shop or a coffee shop, or maybe they sell tires. Pick a business. Before you go in to see them, you should do a little reading about their business. Eh, 20 minutes, half an hour. Just try to understand what their business is. So when you go in there and you talk to them about their app, 
at least you can ask them some fairly intelligent questions about their business. And this is going to give them, the client or the prospective client, more, confident, more confidence in the work that you do because they'll see that, hey, this, this guy knows a little bit about my business. And it will also help you to better figure out how to best apply your coding skills to their particular job at hand. So that's a little trick. That's one trick which you could use. Figure out, know the business a little bit, study it a bit, especially if it's a known business. Figure out if it's a pretty, let's say it's a popular restaurant in your town. You know, check out the reviews, look at the food they serve, look at their menu, look at their the ambiance. And you can discern a lot about a business by, by understanding what they do, also understanding their industry. And... Um, that will help you, again, to be more profitable, to have better relationships with your clients, save you a lot of time. At the end of the day, I hope you're picking up on this, the freelance developer has to have a broader range of skills than somebody who just works at a company and their job is just to build the UI or their job is just to use React Native to build uh, the front end or their job is just to, to write the middle layer in the PHP or in Python or in Java. You see, it's a broader skill set uh, you have to be curious. Uh, for me, it's much more interesting because it's, you're not just doing code. You're doing a bunch of different things related to it, and you're learning to manage the whole thing, which could lead to a lot of great things down the road because once you've done a few client projects and you've built their web apps or their websites, you have a much better idea about maybe setting up your own business down the road because you, you will have touched off on all these different things. Whereas if you just work for a company, you're going to have a very myopic, a very narrow point of view about things, and you will not be aware of all these other considerations, all these other processes, all these other skills that you have to have as an entrepreneur or as a freelancer. Again, communication skills becomes even more important in the freelancing world because it will literally affect, and immediately, it will literally affect how much money you make. So... You see that in my coding courses, by the way, where I, I get into uh, the real world perspective in terms of what I teach. If you look at any given programming language, they're vast, right? If you look at JavaScript or Python or Java or C Sharp, uh, PHP, Ruby, what whatnot, they're huge. And the good developing, a good developer course really teaches you the key fundamentals, the core fundamentals that you're going to be using on a daily basis rather than going down these obscure paths. That's why, like in my Python course, I was tempted to put in to teach you how to build a shooter, which would be kind of cool, I suppose. It would be kind of fun. Oh, look, I built a shooter. But what you're going to learn is that the type of programming to build a shooter you're rarely ever going to use in Python programming because people don't use Python to build shooters. Anyhow, so the lifestyle of the freelancer is more freedom, more variety in the type of work that you do, so it's kind of interesting that way. It gives you uh, a lot of choice in terms of the type of jobs you do, when you work, how you work, but at the same time, it takes more work to establish yourself because you've got to establish these processes, whether deal, your processes of dealing with clients, processes in terms of how you uh, develop your projects and your code bases. I hope this is useful. It's a bit of a Saturday afternoon rambling, but I figure, eh, you know, I'm, again, trying to bring more of a real-world experience into uh, the coding world because out there in YouTube land and elsewhere, it's a lot of noobs or a lot of people who've only worked for somebody for a couple of years. So I'm bringing in the two decades, and, and generally speaking, to, to get two decades of experience, and generally speaking, um, well, not generally. I've never worked for anybody as a coder. I've always been either a contractor, freelancer, or developed my own apps and my own SaaS. Uh, and the current one, of course, is Studio Web. It's an interactive training SaaS. And uh, so you can see how I design my stuff there. And it's, for instance, if you do good UI and UX, user interface and user experience work, uh, they stand the test of time now. So Studio Web's UI, UX, it's, it's pretty much where it was six years ago. And it's been modified and tweaked and, and, and polished, but it still works fantastically. And even though it's, it's like six, seven years old, but it's kind of like iOS. iOS is pretty much what it's been for the last five, six years, but because it's pretty refined, same with Android, it hasn't changed too, too radically. And that's a good sign because that means 
you got some a solid base there, right? Same with macOS, right? macOS since OS 10, it's pretty solid. Yes, there's been some changes, but it's pretty much the same with nice polishes and nice refinements over time. Whereas like Windows Vista, which was like a total disaster, they had to like boot that, put that in the trash, and they've come out, you know, and then they had Windows 8, and then they had to trash that because all was garbage, because total radical change. Now they have Windows 10, and I think they're gonna, they've done a decent job with that, although I have my problems with it. But you notice how Mac OS has been pretty consistent for many years now, where Windows have kept having the trash, kept having the trash. So when you have uh, a code base or a UI, a UX that's consistent over time, you know you got something good there. All right, a bit of a rambling video, but it's Saturday afternoon. What do you expect? As usual, if you have questions, you want me to expand in any of the little areas that I touched off on this video, just let me, let me know in the comments below, and I'll do my best to respond. All right, thanks a lot. Bye-bye.